Good morning, St. James. It's good to be with you, and I hope you've had a great week. I don't have a whole lot to report except that today is our first outdoor worship, thanks to the Timberlakes. I look forward to reporting back about how it went uh, and to give you more details about our next outdoor worship, which will be on July 26. All of the same protocols will apply, uh, and we will need you to sign up for that as well. And we thank the Christians for opening up their place for us in two weeks. Uh, so again, that's July 26. And the only other announcement is uh, the one I make every week is that uh, I am blessed uh, to know how effectively you all are reaching out to one another. And I ask that you continue that, uh, that you continue to reach out to one another, uh, to lift each other up in prayer, uh, and certainly make uh, me or the leadership of the church aware of any pastoral needs that, uh, that might exist. So with that, let us begin our worship. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Greetings, St. James from the Walker family. We hope everyone's having a wonderful weekend. Stay safe, and we miss you all. Love you. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do, and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church, especially for Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan and Jennifer, our bishops, Ben and Ted, our clergy. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people, especially for Donald, our president, the Congress, and the Supreme Court of the United States. We pray also for those in law enforcement, for their safety, their morale, and that they may know the support and gratitude of the communities they serve. We pray for those in, arm, in the armed forces, their families, and all deployed in harm's way, especially Mark. I ask your prayers for all of those who have suffered or feared discrimination, mistreatment, or violence because of their God-given identity. Help us to understand, to acknowledge our corporate responsibility, and guide us towards sustained healing, reconciliation, and unity. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, the lonely, the burdened, the anxious, and those in prison, especially during this season. Pray for those in any need or trouble, especially for Karen, Judy, Helen, Carol, Steve, Bonnie, Amini, Christine, Steve, Judy, John, Joan, Kay, Ansel, Tina, Linda, Fred, Kay, Ed, Barbara, Anne, Marilee, Marie, and for those whom we now name either silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for all healthcare and emergency workers, those who continue to put themselves at increased risk to provide essential services, and those facing economic insecurity as a result of COVID-19. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper, need, a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by God. I ask your prayers for St. James Episcopal Church and School, our Stephen ministers and their care partners. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died, especially any whom we now name, either silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for the faithful and growing relationships between First Baptist Church and St. James Episcopal Church. We give thanks for our many blessings, which we now name either silently or aloud.
Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. From wherever we find ourselves, we offer our prayers to you, the God who promises to abide with us. During this time, may we know and trust your presence in our lives. Continue to bind us together, embolden us as your church to be signs and agents of your hope, your healing, and your love. We pray this in the name of your Son, who came and dwelt among us, Jesus our Lord. Amen. Our Lord. Our Lord. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path. And the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil. And they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what's sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the world, and it yields nothing. But as for what's sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields. In one case, hundredfold, in another sixty, and another thirty. The word of the Lord. Good morning, St. James. It's nice to be back here preaching to this community that means so much to me. Today's sermon is divided into three parts. The first part will be the Sunday Bible study. The second part will be a vignette out of my own life. And the third part will be the most important part, the so what part of the sermon. And what I plan to do during this sermon is to let you know where, when each part has concluded so that you'll know where your redemption, when your redemption is drawing near. Part one, our Sunday school Bible study. C.H. Dodd, a priest of the Church of England, was a great 20th century biblical scholar. And he said that a parable, like the parable we just heard as our gospel for today, the parable of the sower, Dodd said that a parable is a common, is from nature or our common life. It ar is arresting the hearer by its uniqueness or strangeness, and it leaves the mind in sufficient doubt of its precise reflection or application to tease our minds into active thought. So what I'm hoping is that the parable of the sower will tease our minds this morning into active thought. As you recall from hearing the gospel just read, it is divided into 
two significant parts. The first part is the parable itself. A sower went out to sow some seed. And the second part of our gospel reading for today, scholars tell us, is St. Matthew's Church, a Jewish Christian church of the first century, trying to make sense of a parable they remembered from Jesus in their own context, in their own lived reality. And there are two things to notice, we think, about Matthew's church and its context. The first thing to notice is that church was a Jewish Christian community. They still considered themselves Jews. They still considered themselves in relationship with other Jews. And the primary question that was informing their interpretation of the remembered parable was that some of their fellow Jews believed the good news of Jesus and some could not believe it. And that was a theological dilemma for them. Also, we're able to tease out from this interpretation, from the interpretive part of today's gospel, other issues that were prevalent in the life of that Jewish Christian church. The primary one being that some people seem to have an initial springing of faith, and that that faith tended to um, evaporate or grow dim over time. So how do you deal with those who have an initial appreciation and belief in the gospel, and then over time that belief seems to wither? So those two, uh, those two issues seem to define the interpretation. So, given that sort of Sunday school lesson background, or backdrop, we have a parable that Jesus told, and we have in today's Gospel reading a subsequent interpretation of that parable through uh, the Jewish Christian community that produced St. Matthew's Gospel. With that as background, and part one is now over, I want to just share with you a vignette from my own life. My job as a preacher is to describe how to illustrate the parable of the sower 2,000 years after it was told. I think primarily this parable, the way it teases our mind, this parable is a parable about a lavish, almost foolish generosity. A sower went out and in almost wild abandon or with disregard for the quality of the soil on which the seed would land, nevertheless, something so precious, so important as seed, seed which is today's bread scattered towards tomorrow's hope, this precious commodity is generously lavished. So, I ask myself the question, when have I been defined, or when have I responded to a lavish generosity? And suddenly I found myself in June of 1967. That is 53 years ago. I had gone down the lane, as I had done several days previously, to open the mailbox and to get my grades from my first year in college. The second semester had not gone well. The only thing that, that improved in the second semester of my college career was my bridge playing ability. I was getting very good at bridge and I was enjoying the company of my smart bridge playing friends. I enjoyed the game. I enjoyed the subsequent conversations. I probably enjoyed a little more of 3-2 beer than was helpful. And I did not enjoy hitting the books as much as I enjoyed bridge. I opened the envelope, looked at my grades, and I was so ashamed. 
I had known that my parents, who were not particularly wealthy people, hard, my dad was a farm manager and managed our own small farm. Uh, my mother was a stay-at-home mom. I can remember maybe four vacations in my first 18 years of life. But I also knew that my mother and my father had set aside each month, had gone to the bank each month, and purchased a United States savings bond for my college education that had been made known to me. When I opened that envelope, I saw my grade point average for my freshman year of college. And I, by the very skin of my teeth, was not on academic probation, but I had done miserably in the second semester. I was so ashamed. My parents did not say one critical or judgmental word to me. It was only as I examined my performance in light of their generous, generous sacrifice that I determined that that was a one-off. I would not be as irresponsible again. Generosity, not criticism, not punishment, but my parents' generosity turned me back towards purposefulness. So, that's the end of part two of the sermon. My own experience. But it's now 2020. The parable of the sower is before us. And so the third part of this sermon is the so what part. So what? If we Christians live our lives out of the faith we have received and claimed, and if we know anything as Christians, we know that a generous, lavish, all risking love is the foundational reality of the world. We know the God who was so obsessed with this world that with an abundance of risk and no caution took our neighborhood, taught and showed us a vision of the beloved community and died on the hard wood of the cross in the arid outskirts of a desert city. Something so precious as an only son was cast upon this world and was crushed and was buried. And mysteriously and miraculously, this precious seed, this only son, lived, sprouted, was resurrected, to prove the power of lavish, risky, even foolish generosity. So my sisters and my brothers, not in St. Matthew's church of 2,000 years ago, but in our church, in our community, in our now, in our pandemic, in our struggle for justice, in our year of political choosing, in our fears, as we live among people we love who choose differently from us the way folks in Matthew's church chose differently about the Jesus story, how do we live our now? How do we live in response to lavish generosity described by the Book of Common Prayer as gratitude for our creation, preservation, and all of life's blessings, but as the prayer book says, but above all for the immeasurable love for the redemption of the world in our Lord Jesus Christ. Even in this time where things seem arid and dry, Will, when illness in our nation is on the rise and where jobs are on the decline, where division, not unity, seems to reign, what must 
we know? Well, we are alive today. Most of us still have resources today. We believe in the resurrection today. And if we are breathing, we have time today. And generous love beckons us today to give ourselves to our holy now, capital N, to our holy now, to our moment. So in our now, we make the phone call and we put on our mask and we keep six feet of distance and sit on a porch with a lonely friend. We, in our now, contribute to human need. And in our now, we give ourselves to a generous cause. And above all else, even in our desert, we see and we observe where hope is sprouting up. The sower went out to sow some seed. Amen. God, I look to you. I will not be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom to know just what to do. And I will love you, Lord, my strength. And I will love you, Lord, my shield. And I will love you, Lord, my rock forever. Remember that life is short, and we have too little time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be quick to be kind, make haste to love, and the blessing of God Almighty, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you always. Our worship is now ended, and our service in the world begins. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia.